This is 11 ways to survive the holidays with your family. Adjust your expectations. There, one, adjust your expectations. It will suck. It will be the most horrible, torturous event in your whole life. The, the crappier the expectations you have, the better. And then, and if anything non-crappy happens, you're happy, see? Look how clever that is. Just think it's going to be horrible. Number two. Manage yourself, not them. It's all your fault, so manage yourself in advance. And if you try to get lost in trying to control other people, then yeah, that is a trap. Disengage from drama. That's also bad, but that's not bad. Yeah. You have a choice to disengage unless they trap you physically or emotionally or bait you. So the best you can disengage. Not bad. But easier said than done. <laughs> Resist defensiveness. Ha <laughs> ha. This is clever. This is, or this is one thing that I've been trying to teach that if you get defensive, you give your power over to the person that that baited you. <laughs> That's tricky. Maybe we'll try to cover that more. Take time out. Release your need to control. Go. Take time out. Uh, no, just stay in there and suffer more. Okay. Release your need to control or fix. Control, caretake, or fix. Now, how the heck do you do that? <laughs> if you have a need to control and fix and rescue, how do you release it? You just throw it away, throw it over your shoulder, and it's just gone? Is that how you release it? For you diehard codependents, I think it's harder to do than six. Six is hard. Seven. Practice ahead of time. Have a Jody come to the meeting and you can practice ahead of time. See, look, we had a gift from Jody. Find positive ways to connect. Be creative. If you can't connect emotionally, maybe you can connect over uh, smoking weed or a board game or common enemy intimacy. You can hate somebody together. That's probably an easy way. Do things you like. Oh, that's dangerous. That's like. Do have some control in some say. Do have some control in some say. Do have some control. You should keep what you like invisible because they will punish you for doing things you like. Oh, number 10. This is interesting. Rely on a voice of reason. Where would you find a voice of reason? I don't know. Laura probably has it when she's like muted. She's the voice of reason. Just think of her. And rules are different for narcissistic family holidays. Oh, look, all 10 rules don't work. <laughs> you need different rules for narcissistic dysfunctional family holidays. What kind of asshole would give you 10 rules and then tell you all those rules that are different? Or you need more rules. What are the additional rules you get now that you have a fucked up dysfunctional family? It may be difficult to play. It will be difficult to connect. <laughs> it may be difficult to connect. It may be difficult to manage the toxic effect in you. It will fucking suck. From the great amount of gaslighting guilt. There will be gaslighting, there will be guilt tripping, there will be psychological baiting and warfare. Tripping, shaming, rage, whatever may happen during the holidays. Shorten the time that you visit. Don't go. <laughs> Run away. Have an emergency. Do self-harm so you can go to the hospital. Oh, shorten your visit time. <laughs> You can always make the time shorter. Don't argue and don't confront. 
<laughs> don't be defensive. Yeah. Easier said than done. But I don't really recommend during the holiday times people argue or confront. That's not a good time to do that. That is a, always the time to do it. That's what is a holiday. <laughs> Isn't that the definition of holidays? When you argue and confront and get drunk and bring up issues from past family confrontations? <laughs> there are other times that we... There's other times. <laughs> Huh? We can use to address certain issues. Don't use the holidays to do it. And as Ross Rosenberg says, observe, don't absorb. That works if you're high. Get more high. Don't take things said and done as rational or true or take them personally. Don't take things personally. When it's personal. Just don't take it. Focus on your limits and your boundaries. Don't care to... Focus on your boundaries or your limits. Be nice to yourself, you guys. Don't care take or fix other people. Is that this other stupid advice? <laughs> Let's see. Take or try to fix others. Don't rescue people. But then how do you deal with your anxiety if you can't rescue someone else and dump your anxiety on someone? I thought that's what holidays are for. <laughs> the last one, I think. And then you may want to just be boring. Be boring. That's At least that's a positive focus, not just a don't negative focus. Or just fly under the radar. Fly under the radar. Blame shift. Find a new scapegoat to dump onto. Or bring a new friend as a scapegoat. Blame shifting is a better strategy. If you have a narcissistic family, just fly under the radar. Okay, so here's 11, 10 rules on the left. But those 10 rules don't really matter if you have a dysfunctional fucked up family. So then you have all these rules. But you can just simplify it and just be born and fly under the radar. If you want to up your game, you can fly under the radar and then you can blame shift. That's my add-on. Always have a scapegoat. Always redirect it to, to the scapegoat. Or you can scapegoat yourself and you can just like open yourself and just bleed pure toxic depression and that'll scare off people so did anything catch anybody's attention does anyone want to argue or add anything to the list rule number one be comfortable with yourself and what you have to offer or don't go it's not rule number one. I think that's the only rule. Uh, the only rule. Save yourself a lot of trouble instead of having 68 things that you have to do right or don't do or only do sometimes or only do it with some people. Like just be yourself. Make sure you're a good person. And if you're not going to be around people who are going to respect that, then don't go. Be yourself. And number two, <laughs> make sure you're a good person. <laughs> Doesn't that assume you know who yourself is? <laughs> yes. And number two, be a good person. Doesn't that mean you have like a moral philosophy that your conscience is clear about? <laughs> yeah, don't be a dick. That's the rule. Is that easy to do? <laughs> More for some than others, it seems. <laughs> what if dickness is contagious? So if you get immerse yourself in a bunch of family dysfunction and they're all dicks around you, could it be possible that dickness could wear off and you'll be a dick in their presence? That's too much dick for any party that I go to. <laughs> Do 
Robbie's got stay in your own lane. How do you do that? Don't engage. Don't engage and get in their lane. What if they get in your lane? Then leave. What if they block the exit? Then, you know, you got to bully through it. Call the police. Keep your phone. <laughs> what if they call the police before you? <laughs> They'll not react. <laughs> Retreat and rethink. What if they call the police and then they make up charges on you? <laughs> and they cry better than you. <laughs> and you can't, and the police are there. You, you can't leave from the police, can you? <laughs> Don't engage. But they called the police on you. Gotta have evidence. They make it up right in front of you. They start punching themselves, they're bleeding, and they have evidence against you, and they say that you did it. Yeah. <laughs> These are somewhat real stories from members who've had uh, partners who threaten that. Yes, they are. Yeah. So how do you stay in your lane or not engage when you have someone that's willing to call social police, real police, to trap you so you can't leave or disengage? They'll actually escalate if you try to leave. Gray Rock? They'll escalate. You're <laughs> fucked. <laughs> See? That's... Number one, adjust your expectations. <laughs> no more. Recognize you're fucked. Don't think that any one of these rules is going to keep them from being assholes or dicks or trapping you. <laughs> rules are good as a... as a principle, but if they don't follow the rules, <laughs> if they call the police and they make up shit, they can bait you. So then you, it's hard to do Grey Rock, it's hard to Stay in your own lane. It's hard to just skip it. <laughs> well, if it's that awful, then no, you shouldn't go. But I say ahead of time, you have to get brave and set your bound. Well, call them boundaries if you want, but you have to say how long you're going to stay, and don't don't stay longer than you think you can tolerate them. And so for how do you manage your do you have like a gas gauge on your cell phone that says, this is my tolerance level, so you can track it when it's hitting red or yellow? Yeah. How yes, do you I track have... your... Yeah, I have that app coming out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I plan to get rich with it. No. With my mother, for instance, I had to say, yes, I, uh, I'll be there and I will stay from this date to this date. And you know what? That took the anxiety off of me because I had established in my control my own end date of that visit. Doesn't work. So I'm that sure managed your expectation yet. Yeah. You that, had a exit. Yeah, yeah. I guess that would be it. Right. Mm -hmm. You could just not buy into the whole holiday bullshit. You know, who says we have to get together as family? Exactly. That's good. You don't have to. <laughs> so what's your, but what's, what if that's the norm your whole life? <laughs> You're just going to just dump that? Oh, I'm just opting out of the holidays. <laughs> that's what I did. I'm not saying it was right, but it was right for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some years, some years it feels like the intercalation is off. Like it's like we're on two different calendars. And so it's just like I don't want to, I don't want to, it's like I, I, I don't need the tolerance app, right? But I will stay shorter. You'll stay shorter. That's a compromise. Are you slowly... You know, if the narc wants me for the holiday, then they have to behave. I'm the one with the leverage. Oh, okay. How do you negotiate that? 
Sounds nice. You Is leave it that easy? at the holiday where they misbehave. You just leave, you walk out. Then they know they have to behave themselves at all other holidays. Mm. Okay. So if you just It leave... depends on if they have other supply. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, yeah. It's, it depends on if they have other supply. If they have other supply, they don't care if you leave. Oh, okay. So then you need another consequence if they have other supply. I recommend engulfment, but Vaknin even admits it, but he doesn't really describe it because engulfment is so counterintuitive. Narcissistic modification is the total disintegration of the narcissist's defenses, including his false self. Narcissistic modification is the outcome of public shaming and naming and humiliation. So with narcissists, you can do public shaming, which is dangerous. I think you can also do engulfment. With borderline, they're usually the trickier uh, chaos. What does he recommend or how does he describe it? The borderline reacts with injury or mortification to abandonment, rejection, and ironically, to engulfment. Engulfment. And I'd argue that engulfment also works on a narcissist. To engulfment. When the borderline's intimate partner gets too close to her, the fear, she feels that he is about to assimilate her. And this is known as engulfment anxiety. Create engulfment anxiety. So they're used to you running away. If you turn into the into the pity, you turn into the bait and you flood them, then they'll want you to not go. Uh, they'll They'll give you what you want. Much more strongly, the borderline reacts to any threat, real or imaginary, of rejection and abandonment. Now, the thing with borderline is because they have dysregulated emotions, because their emotions overwhelm them, drown them, they are, they are not firewalled against emotions and they cannot regulate the intensity. See, this is a back door. Not just with borderlines, but also narcissists, probably all cluster bees. If they're dumping toxic shit onto you so easily, that's one way out. <laughs> but that one way out means it's also same way in. There's a doorway. If they're going to entrain and dump their hate on you, they can receive it. There's a two-way street. And it's a sense it's like a, a defensive chicken. Okay, yeah, that's probably the theory. So, If you get defensive, that's their game. They want you to get defensive so that the, they're the greatest victim. It's a victim plea. And then once they're the greatest victim, they make you God. You cause this, now you must fix it. Once you get defensive, you play victim and you want them to be God, to be God and you want them to fix it but you're not willing to be as mean as them, so it's a lose battle. But if you have empathy and you feel more, you might be able to posture with more pity because codependents are pitiful, so you have a lot of excess pity. So if you just sit in your pitiness, your pitiful, depressive, hopeless resentment, whatever, <laughs> and just flood them, at least it's something different to try. Or the occurrence of emotions. We can generalize and say that borderlines are only mortified. They are very, very rarely merely injured. They go from zero to, to hero or from zero to 60 in no time. So here's the sequence. Abandonment, rejection, humiliation, or engulfment, mortification, Decompensation, losing all the defenses, 
acting out risky, reckless, defiant actions, including a great. And if you know they act out, do it before them. Beat them to the punch or tell them they're, they're going to act out. So then they have to act out a different way. Shame them in advance of the acting out. So that if they act out, you can say, see, I'm right. <laughs> and they'll hate that. So <laughs> they'll do everything they can to act out differently because you call it out in advance. If you call it out after the fact, they'll make up shit. But if you, <laughs> you know their pattern, you can call it. <laughs> or you act it out yourself. <laughs> and you fuck up their energy. Because if you can tolerate emotions and you, you posture that first, then you're intimidating them by your ability to express and contain it and feel emotions and they'll, they'll, they'll be confused. Okay. This is what I did with my mother and it worked and I, I'm thinking I did it. I'm think well, that doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody because I never could figure out why it worked, but let's talk it out and see. Okay. So I, I was grown. I had my, I had a child. I had a child. So I, so, but I went to the state where she lived. And so I was at her place and she started to whine. I, I know I've told the story. She started to whine about something. You don't, I don't know how you would, but the, and I turned on my heel and I looked at her and I said, well, mother, do you really want to know? That is the first time in my life I ever confronted her back. Nice. And then, and then she just didn't know what to say. And I thought, oh, my God, why did I wait all these years to do that? You know, I was all I, I had, I had it all ready. I had it all ready. I was going to just lay it out there. And then I didn't yep. even have it. She backed off when you just changed mm -hmm. your energy. Yeah. I mean, and I think she, you know, the reason it probably wouldn't work over and over again is because she probably would figure I'd do it again. And this was just a surprise. Maybe that's what, why it worked. I don't know why it worked. I'm trying to think where else I used it and it worked, but I don't remember. But don't codependents and empaths usually, instead of putting forth that energy, we usually want to appease and make it work. You know, oh, here, let me fix it. We're having a holiday. That was another thing I was going to mention that I've heard and read. And, and in, in my life, this has been true. The narcissistic people at holidays want to ruin it with their negative energy. It's negative everything, you know, it's like, it's like if you're having a good day, they want to have a bad day to wreck it. So you got a different reaction from her because you said you stood up to her and said, do you really want to know? And you had you a really giant list prepared. Yeah. And then she backed down or shut up. Yeah. <clears throat> She became like putty in my hands. She was just, um, what do you call it? Submissive, uh, not submissive. Submissive. Yeah, kind of submissive, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm trying to think if she was submissive for days onward. I don't think that. I think she was submissive for the couple days of the rest of my visit. She was not even pleasant, but she was shy and different personality like, than I'd ever seen. Not full of herself, not um, grandiose. And it lasted a few days. Yeah. And you don't think you, you can elicit the same injury in future interactions? I feel like I feel like it probably would be able I I would be able to <laughs> elicit the same response. Yes. And and prop maybe that's maybe that's what somebody like me <clears throat> needs to do since I'm normally um 
I want to say recessive, and that's not the right word, but I'm normally, you know, I hold back. Well, and so maybe that's something to practice, thinking about how to be more upfront in a, how I feel about things. I don't know, but it worked in that situation. So you were more upfront about your feelings or you challenged you challenge her a uh, pity story so if she's doing a pity story like oh, poor pitiful me someone rescue me yeah victim and then you said do you really want to know why no one rescues rescues you yeah yeah she didn't want to know why she wanted to be rescued. She didn't want to know why. See? Yeah. Right. Well, and but I wasn't going to play the part. That was her role. You didn't just me. not play her part. You said you were going to flutter with why she, why people don't rescue her, why people don't like her, why people think she's a bitch. You no, were why threatening I, to. Why I. Yeah. Think Okay, That's even me. worse. You were going to say not, why you didn't like her. Right. And she emotionally sensed that. Then she didn't have another card to play for that visit. Right. To play a victim plea. Mm -hmm. So it lasted for a few days. Isn't that good results? That's good results. Maybe that would last enough to get you through a holiday. <laughs> if you out victim them and you don't uh, you say I don't give a damn about your victim card. Yeah. It's not my concern. It's not my concern. It's not my concern. It's not my concern. That's your problem. That's your problem. That's your problem. That's your problem. Right. In essence, I don't care. And if they yeah. ask you, if they ask you, <clears throat> did you read my text? And you say, no, I didn't have time. Yeah. Or you say, yes. <laughs> you say, yes, and leave it at that. <laughs> like, hey, it made no, it made no, in, it made no inroads with me. Yeah, you could say that uh, subliminally, but ultimately you say, oh, yes, I did, and then I'm not doing anything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Send me yep. another one. Yep. Or, oh, yes, and I didn't understand it. Uh, or <laughs> or I, I, I read it. I have to get back to it. Uh, so that's a good <laughs> give one. Give me a few days. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. So if they're trying to bait you, and you know their baiting techniques. Yeah. That was baiting. If you're passive, you can try to say there isn't bait. But if you're more active, you can say, oh, I see the bait. And I don't care. Or you can say, oh, I see your bait. Here, you can have it back. So. <laughs> Here, you can have it back. Yeah. <laughs> or, I see your bait, and I'll be a better victim. Let me give you a counter bait. That'd be I can match your bait. That, that we I both never suck. Tried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never tried it, but it could work. Because if you try to say the bait doesn't exist and you try to run away, they know they they know that you saw the bait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're trying to run away, you're trying to avoid it. Mm -hmm. They know it sort of landed. So the more you can disarm the bait by calling it out, or saying you don't care, or out victiming them by flooding that same pity story to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's the me too answer. So that's what Jody complained about. Yeah, <laughs> she did. She did. So it yeah, stopped Jody. So you can stop your partners and family members by saying me too. So they have a pity story. Say me too. I suck. I don't like that either. And then we're both stuck. That sort of. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
So in a sense, you're trying, you're using their tactic, which is trying to throw you off the point, 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 trying to throw. So if they try to throw you off the point, you can throw them off the point too. Anything's fair game. So victim plea, you throw another victim plea. Other ideas. Mm. Or anything interesting in the chat? Mm. Play dumb, Columbo. Yeah. Just give them nonsense. Sometimes that works. Give them nonsense. Confuse them. Sure. It irritates the hell out of them. Yeah. That's kind of fun to watch sometimes. Oh, look at Kelly. Oh, poke, poke, poke. Okay. <laughs> Give nonsense and watch the confusion. Mm hmm. Because <laughs> they try and make sense out of it because they think, yeah, oh, you're probably trying to make sense. When you're not. Yeah, that is a confusion technique. I think that was in uh, Bradshaw's book. One of the eight C's was say something confusing or use jargon. Big words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or get good at word salad. So that's that's a hard skill. Mm -hmm. I have an example of Kiefer Neary word salad, but that would confuse people right now. <laughs> really impressive. So where do we go from here? What shall we do? Has anyone heard about the um, Netflix series uh, Stutz, S-T-U-T-Z? It's uh, Jonah Hill. He made a documentary about his therapist, Phil Stutz. I thought it was... Um, people are saying his therapist is so good, but I thought it was his therapist showing his own issues. So I made some clips. Why am I like hiding behind perfection? Why am I hiding behind a facade instead of letting you in on it? If the choice is to be fair and honest, then I should acknowledge that we've been shooting for two years and we're wearing the same clothes every day, pretending it's one session. Shooting for two years to make it look like one day session <laughs> to try to make a film two years of shooting. <laughs> but it's been years and we're on a green screen. We're not in your office. And I'm literally wearing a wig right now to make it look like it was eight months ago when I had this haircut and I literally have like a shaved head. I don't know. It just feels weird and false. It's just hard to know like what is what at this point. But So that's pretty good. That's sort of Kelly's technique. Make people confused on what is what. Is what at this point. But ultimately I just came to like the truth which is just like letting you in on it. It has to eventually. See there if you just stay with the truth and let people in on the fakeness and just call it out. You call out their defensive patterns. So in a sense, you can use ISTDT <laughs> strategically in social situations by calling out people's defenses in advance. And then they can't, you don't have to follow the bait because you already called in advance or they're going to have to use their brain to come up with another defense. 
Well, that's, yeah, more advanced. Really get intimate. And once things get intimate, you don't know what the f But ultimately, I just came to you like the truth, which is just like letting you in on it. He's thinking of what to reply. It has to eventually get intimate. And once things get intimate, you don't know what the fuck is going to happen. This is engulfment anxiety. If you can hold intimacy more than a cluster B or a manipulator, they will back down. If you're a true codependent, you should be able to tolerate more intimacy than a cluster B. You're still pretty intimacy adverse, but this is something you can build as a muscle. <laughs> and you dive into the land of intimacy, then both sides will be in new territory. And you'll have more, because of your warm empathy, you'll have more ability to navigate intimacy than a cluster B. You know, if I've trained you properly, you can just see that is not something to avoid. The failure would be not rolling with it and not using it to go deeper. You can't move forward without being vulnerable. And the reason is everybody needs help in moving forward and fail. I think there's a logical thing there because he's trying to make it make sense. You can see his eyes like, how do I make this sentence make sense? <laughs> how do I make this into an injunction? would be not rolling with it and not using it to go deeper. You can't move forward without being vulnerable. You can't move forward without being vulnerable. Let's type that out. <laughs> We're using transcripts like Kay's talking about. Because he's got this because. <laughs> What's the because? Can you be vulnerable by like just holding your frame? And just like just hold the frame and not like chase and go after the what's happening externally. That's controlling your attention. <laughs> that's staying calm. That's staying on point. <laughs> what's the point of what you're doing right now? What's the point of what you're doing right now? Trying to throw you off the point. They'll keep trying to shift it. They'll keep trying to shift it. They'll keep trying. What's the point of what you're doing right now? They'll keep What's trying to the shift it. They'll keep trying to right shift now? it. They'll keep trying. What's the point of what? You so if you stay in your frame, you're not following in their sandbox. You're not taking the bait. So uh, if you don't have a a good muscle at staying on on point, then it will feel vulnerable. And if they don't like you not following their sandbox, they will escalate and make you feel more vulnerable. Yeah. But you had so said you if can... you turn to them instead of, because if you, if you, if they realize you're seeing the bait, then they're just going to escalate. Whereas if you turn to them and give them something that I guess counter offers their offer uh, enough. Well, if you stay on point and they don't like it and they escalate on you, then you have to deal with the consequences of their escalation or their leverage on you. So you can go to their sandbox and give them a different response than they wanted. I was suggesting engulfment as usually the ultimate go to that you want to build up to because that's one of their weaknesses, and it gives them less of a narcissistic injury. Where if you give them an injury or try to do a blame game, they're used to that. That's just mudslinging. They're faster, so you're you're fighting in their territory if you try to blame and blame. But if you go shift to their their sandbox, you can call out their bait. You can call out their defense. that discharges the sandbox. Or you can own their de defense and just flood them with that. Or you can take their blame and you just start bleeding pitiful sadness onto them. Take the spotlight of how much you suck and how you always suck and just like sob on their clothes and start like spewing snot on them. <laughs> They want you to say you're going to change. You can just say, 
I'm never going to change. I am such a horrible boyfriend. You should never, you should, this is so bad. I'm, I've gone to therapy five years and I still suck at this. I'm, everyone hates me and just like throw up on them, vomit, hopelessness onto them. <laughs> Because they're doing a performance. Why can't you do a counter performance? Just giving you some more options. You have to see what fits your personality. But this guy's got a s injunction, I think. <laughs> you can't move forward without being vulnerable. In the okay. And the reason why. <laughs> you can't move forward without being vulnerable. And the reason why. The reason is... Everybody needs help in moving forward. Everybody needs help in moving forward. He's making us jump to a different sandbox, and then is there going to be a different sandbox after that? That's a truthism. And failure, weakness, vulnerability, it's like a connector, a connection. Failure, weakness, and vulnerability. is a connector. Zoe is here. Come on. Come up. Come up. Come on. Come up. Give me the answers. Give me the answers. Give me the answers. You need your presence. It's been so slow and dull. <laughs> This is Stutz saying he started with, you can't move forward without being vulnerable because everybody needs help moving forward. That doesn't even fucking make sense, does it? <laughs> you can't move forward without being vulnerable because everybody needs help in moving forward. Then he says, failure, weakness, and vulnerability is a connection, is a connector, which is a truthy truthism. <laughs> oh, it might be circular. Okay, let's see. Is there a third part? To the rest of the world. If I've trained you properly, hi, rest of the world. Vulnerability, it's like a connector. It connects you to the rest of the world. It connects you to the rest of the world. <laughs> You can't move forward without being vulnerable because everybody needs help in moving forward. Failure, weakness, and vulnerability is a connector. It connects you to the rest of the world. Can someone translate that for me? Everybody needs help moving forward. You can't move forward without being vulnerable. Why can't you move forward without being vulnerable? Why why can't you move yeah, forward being invulnerable? <laughs> dumb statement. What? Yeah. What does vulnerability have to do with moving forward? <laughs> right. You can't have chocolate without You can be butter. vulnerable yeah. going forward. You can be vulnerable staying status quo. You can be vulnerable going backwards. What does moving forward and being vulnerable why is that inherently linked? Could this be his, uh, his own personal injunction that he always has to move forward, <laughs> even if he feels vulnerable? Could he have a forward thinking bias? And look, he can confuse himself and confuse us and everybody else. So then he can use a confusion technique without trying to confuse somebody else because he's just naturally confused. Then you can have two years of weekly sessions to try to create a movie and you still get fucking stuck. If I've trained you properly... 
because it's about training him properly <laughs> to follow nonsense, non sequitur injunctions <laughs> that give him this look. Does it look like he's been trained properly or does it look like, oh, <laughs> am I pleasing daddy? <laughs> Am I a good submissive to the therapist? Hiding behind a facade. Trained you properly. Weird and false. Trained you properly. False. Hiding facade. Was well, he's training him to hide in a facade? Maybe. Here's a better example of Phil Stutz current status she turned her tragedy with men into a superpower of not being scared of them and getting exactly. great good done yeah she but did. how did you think that affects you having your mom hate men and you being a man um well i know one thing for sure it, it made me insecure around women i mean <laughs> for sure he knows that he's insecure around women it's probably why he became the therapist. He had one of those feminist, aggressive, uh, control the world by pure will. <laughs> I think his, her mom was like, uh, would fight for rental advocacy and politicians were scared of his mom. I think that was part of the movie. Unless it was another movie. So <laughs> his mom was scary to public officials. And he was scared, she was scary to him too. And then that's probably why he became a therapist. Did he learn from it? Did he take his therapy and actually apply skills so he could have a meaningful relationship? What do you think? That's like a no-brainer. It was like there was no pathway inside me that could step to a woman and feel safe. The way she was making me feel. He had no pathway to feel safe. Like there was no pathway inside me that could step to a woman and feel safe. No pathway. No safety. That's his hard wiring. The way she would make me feel is you have no right to even be doing this. You have no right to do anything, or you have no right to exist, or you have to question everything you do. Because he's a man. <laughs> Masculinity was under threat. Or the which the mother was fighting. Where do you stand personally on romantic relationships? You mean am I in one, you mean? Yeah, are you in one? No, I'm not in one. He's not in one. Do you have a history? Is Jonah going to ask something more personal? Um, Did you ever override that wall that was built by your mom and get close in the way you were scared to? With <laughs> Did you ever learn how to get close to a woman, Mr. Expert Therapist? His therapist, his you know, the people were giving glorious reviews for this documentary for some reason. A woman. Um, I would say, yeah, once. He would say, <laughs> that's not a solid yes. That's like, I would say once and that one time, how did it go? But I, for various reasons, I, I can't get into the specifics of it. Was this, I think my big fear with, uh, romantic relationships what i'm learning is is like the only way for them to succeed is for you to be completely vulnerable yeah and humans are so fucked up and we just talk ourselves out of happiness so often that maybe it's worth trying to push you to at least think about it <laughs> his client has to push him to think about it Because as a therapist, you can rescue other people, then you can just ignore your crap because you get paid rescuing other people. <laughs> and you feel like you're doing something. Because rescuing yourself, you feel like you're drowning. That's uh, not pleasant. Well, you've definitely succeeded in that. I 
I can't tell you how, in the last, let's say, three minutes, how many jokes I've had to repress. He's repressing three minutes of jokes to try to soften the anxiety to defend himself. Humor. I get it. I have yeah. the same disease, which is avoid emotion by making jokes. Hey, they both have something in common. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever get in that zone, like the pity party zone? Yeah, I, I get in it all the time. But I'm very fast at getting out of it. And each card has a little bit of a different approach. It's basically the same goal, which is schmuck. Goal. Take action no matter how frightened you are. No matter. What was the conclusion from the last video? <laughs> Move forward be means you're vulnerable. <laughs> Why does he feel vulnerable moving forward? Because he's calling himself a schmuck for not moving forward. His inner critic, his super ego is forcing, willfully forcing him to dive into unknown territory when he's scared. <laughs> Maybe that's what his childhood was like. That's his repetition compulsion. Bug. Take action no matter how frightened you are. No matter how frightened you are. No matter how frightened you are. Dive into unknown territory no matter how frightened you are. And he's training Jonah Hill to do the same damn thing. And he's got a book and he's got this documentary and people are watching this like, Oh, oh my God, this is like amazing tips to force myself to move forward and manipulate myself. And oh, they're not saying it that way. They're like, oh, these are great tips for fixing my life or something. So he has issues with a mother who didn't give him approval. Is this similar with um, Matthew Perry? This is from his audiobook. Not having a parent on that flight is one of the many things that led to a lifelong feeling of abandonment. If I'd been enough, they wouldn't have left me unaccompanied, right? Isn't that how all of this is supposed to work? The other kids had parents with them. I had a sign and a magazine. So that's why when I buy... He didn't like his sign and magazine. He got to travel on his own. He thought that was abandonment. All his framing. A new house, and there have been many. Never underestimate a geographic. It has to have a view. I want the sense that I can look down on safety, on some place where someone is thinking of me. That's where parenting is. That's where love is. That's where home is. I can feel safe now. That's not that big of an ask, just having some parent figure or family figure that you trust is thinking about you, just has you in the sort of arena limelight, tracking you loosely. That's all he wanted. My mom's job, therefore, meant that she was away at work a lot, and I was left to compete with the ongoing concerns of a major Western democracy and its charismatic swordsman leader if I wanted a little attention. I believe the phrase at the time was latchkey kid, a bland term for being left fucking alone. Accordingly, I learned to be funny. Pratfalls, quick one-liners, you know the drill. Because I had to be. My mother was stressed by her stressful job and already highly emotional and abandoned. And me being funny tended to calm her down enough so that she would cook some food. See, another pattern. Being funny to soothe anxiety being funny, parentified child to get food. <laughs> then being funny translates into being an actor. <laughs> and that translates to being charismatic and getting paid money. So he took his, his curse, or he took his parentification, his childhood PTSD turned into a skill. <laughs> Became famous from it. But the inner demons caused him to pursue addictions and destroy his life. But 
Don't focus on that. Focus on his thing. Sit down at the dinner table with me and hear me out, after I heard her out, of course. But I'm not blaming her for working. Someone had to bring home the bacon. It just meant I spent a great deal of time alone. I would tell people I was a lonely child, having misheard the phrase, only child. So, I was a kid with a fast mind and an even faster mouth. But as said, she too had a fast mind and a fast mouth. I wonder where I got it from. We argued a lot, and I always had to have the last word. One time I was having an argument with her. Always having to have the last word. So that's being defensive. Wanting to be right more than being happy. Sometimes your need to be right might get you into trouble. Might make you really unhappy. <laughs> right doesn't mean safe. Right doesn't mean happy. <laughs> right could be meaningless. In a stairwell, and she made me feel the most rage I've ever felt in my life. I was 12 years old, and you can't hit your mother, so the rage turned inward. She, of course, had done. Rage turned inward. See? So that's where he lost his voice. <laughs> turned it inward. Self-hate, depression, then needs more alcohol and drugs to soothe his inner pain away because he wasn't able to express his hate, his boundaries being crossed. And hit your mother, so the rage turned inward. She, of course, had done nothing wrong. But having to see her every day and pretend I was fine about everything reminded me too much of what I had to do every day with my mother back in Ottawa, Canada. I've spent my life being attracted to unavailable women. It doesn't take a psychology degree to figure out that this had something to do with my relationship with my mother. My mother captivated every room she entered. I vividly remember being at some fancy ballroom when I was about six years old, and when my mom came in, Every head in the room turned. I wanted her to turn and look at me in these moments, but she was working and could not. It took me only 37 years to work that one out. Only 37 years? That's not bad. Ever since then, I've been addicted to the turn. Once the turn happened, I could start making a woman laugh and make... So this is his relational addiction. To chase after winning his mother's approval is the turn. That's the goal in his fixation. Making her want me sexually. Once the sex was done, reality set in, and I realized I didn't know these women at all. They were available, so I had no need for them. I had to get back out there and try to make them make the turn. That's <laughs> why I slept with so many women. I was trying to recreate my childhood and win. I knew none of this at the time, of course. I just thought something had gone wrong with them. Surprise, surprise, everyone. Canadian actor boy had some major mommy issues. So therapy has gotten him to understand his problem, or 12 step, that he has mommy issues and he's addicted to the term. Now what does he do with that? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> he's still addicted he's still this this explanation even if it sounds good and makes sense doesn't give him any path for repair he's not addressing his intimacy intimacy issues he's not addressing his ability to be vulnerable in front of somebody it's not addressing real time now issues it's not addressing his ability, his inability to deal with emotions, which he's also identified as an anhedonia in this clip. All this clip has some self-injury harm, so people that have sensitive ears. Hearing his version of self-injury is a bit uh, exciting. I thought it was exciting, but you guys might find it uh, violent. Or negative, I don't know. He didn't die. It's better than his other story of having his colon blow up. That's in the book. Trigger warning. To simply stay alive, I lacked both spiritual guidelines 
and an ability to enjoy anything. But at the same time, I was also an excitement addict. This is such a toxic combination, I can't even. I didn't know this at the time, of course, but if I was not in the act of searching for excitement, being excited, or drunk, I was incapable of enjoying anything. Only when he's seeking something forward. So unlike uh, Phil Stoltz, Stutz, who has to go forward, <laughs> for Matthew Perry, he has to be seeking something to have excitement. Otherwise, he feels numb. Or he feels what he feels. <laughs> and he doesn't want to feel what he feels because that's depressing. That's scary. That's fragmenting. The fancy word for that is anhedonia, a word and feeling I would spend millions in therapy and treatment centers to discover and understand. Maybe that's why I won tennis matches only when I was a set down and within points of losing. Maybe that's why I did everything I did. Anhedonia. I was sitting in my room doing God knows what on... So he's diagnosing himself with anhedonia. But... When he gets stuck without his addictions, when he's in rehab and he can't smoke and he can't drink, underneath the anhedonia is scarier stuff that leads to self-harm. This part. On day four, when something hit me, I don't know what. It was like something was punching me from the inside. But even though I'd been in therapy for more than 30 years, and it had nothing... 30 years... 30 years. Thing new to teach me. I had to do something to get my mind off nicotine. So I left my cell and headed down the hallway, aimless. I had no idea what I was doing or where I was going. I think I was trying to walk outside of my own body. I knew that all the therapists were on the floor below me, but I decided to skip the elevator and make for the stairwell. I didn't really know what was happening. I can't to this day describe what was going on, except that I was in a sort of panic, confusion, a kind of fugue state. Panic, confusion, uncertainty, stairwell where his prior triggers happened, but a fugue state, dissociation. And there was the intense pain again, not pain, but pretty close to it total confusion and I wanted to smoke so badly total confusion and he desires his chemical addictions to soothe the anxiety but he was in rehab so he didn't have access to his cigarettes or painkillers so he improvises so I stopped in the stairwell and thought about all the years of agony and the fact that the yard never got painted blue and Pierre fucking Trudeau those are the disappointments from his childhood. <laughs> Painting the yard blue so people who fly over would think they have a pool. Because <laughs> he cared about people in the sky looking at their home. <laughs> and Pierre, Peter Trubeau, they were part of his uh, upbringing. Or <laughs> his bigger family circle. And the fact that I was then, and still am, an unaccompanied minor. It was like the bad parts of my life were appearing to me all at once. Emotional flashbacks. You slow down and you stop. You take away all the addiction. All your feelings come up. He doesn't have an anhedonia. <laughs> all he has to do is stop and let them come up to the surface, and they come up and they flood him, and then he has to react. I'll never be able to fully explain what happened next, but all of a sudden, I started slamming my head against the wall, as hard as humanly possible. 15 love, slam. 30 love, slam. 40 love, slam. Game, ace after ace. Volley after perfect volley. My head, the ball, the wall, the cement court. All the pain lobbed up but short, me reaching up, smashing my head against the wall, blood on the cement, on the wall, and all over my face, completing the grand slam. The umpire screaming, game, set, match, unaccompanied minor, six love, needs love, six love, scared of love. 
There was blood everywhere. After about eight of these mind-numbing slams, somebody must eight. have heard me and only stopped eight. me and asked the only <laughs> logical question, why are you doing that? I gazed at her and looking like Rocky Balboa from every one of those last scenes, I said, because I couldn't think of anything better to do. Because I couldn't think of anything better to do. Was that 30 years of therapy? <laughs> teaching him how to numb stuff or he's not able to digest it because containing his abandonment terror <laughs> facing it having someone to join him to face it that's been absent that's partially what we're trying to promote here the here and now if you can stay with your emotions and you stay with your triggers you build the muscle to face your own emotions and your flashbacks a little bit more, and then you can face intimacy, vulnerability in the here and the now a little bit more. Even Richard Brannan knows this. You're already at the central nexus point of potency in your life. Here, this is it. Potency. And there's no other time that's more potent than now. Here, now. This is it. Here, now. Here. Because some people like angry Richard. It motivates people. So. And there's no other time that's more potent than now. Here, now. This is it. Here, now. Here. Because we try to present presence and mindfulness as this sort of calm, zen-like state, which is hard to stay with, but staying in the hot here and now, when you're triggered, when someone else is triggered, that's harder. That's the muscle. When you're seeing someone else fall apart and you, you don't rescue them, or you rescue them and you feel you, you can't, your rescue is worthless. <laughs> stay in that in the arena like Robbie's quote in the YouTube comment that's building the muscle that's the way out so engulfment is a technique to give you space from other abusers flood them but at the same time, your homework is to build your capacity to stay in the here and now. Stay in the intensity. Stay with your triggers. Immerse yourself. Get triggered by newbies or jodies or whoever. And just expose yourself to that. Dive into the pain. Dive into it. Over Immerse yourself into that and you see through it. Yes. Work but until you immerse yourself it, in that you don't know the extent of uh, how much you can tolerate, what your limits are, what are your boundaries are to abuse. If every time you get triggered, you run away. <laughs> so, I don't need to deal with this. I don't need to deal with this. Your muscle of dealing with crap is slowly getting smaller, smaller, smaller. Then your world gets smaller, smaller, smaller. And that's a big price to pay. Twelve minutes. So what else do people need for the holidays? Okay, this is a test for the group. When this video was shown about a year and a half ago, the early version, the original version, people did not like it for some stupid reason. I thought the message was nice, but 
a lot of people in the group got triggered. But since she's re-released the video with a, with a necklace, <laughs> I thought it might be interesting to revisit and just see. Because I, I think it's only Holly who was around. So this is Joanna uh, J something Jimpton. Uh, Be like the bison carries a strong message that's been so meaningful to me for the past two years. I was in a really hard place in life when a wise man told me to be like the bison. I like the phrase, be like the bison. I thought it was a decent message and a personal thing. But how do you guys take it? And if you do you find this inspiring or not? Or do you see any dissonance? Or maybe Jeff was around to see it also a year and a half ago. This is a new version, but it's a lot of the same video clip background. When most animals seek shelter or run away when a storm is coming, the bison do the opposite and is heading directly into the storm and face the hardest parts right away so that they come out on the other side of it much faster. Hey, is this the same message as Phil Stutz? You putts, you got to keep moving forward. <laughs> Anyone see any commonality? <laughs> there are certain therapists and people saying, just go forward and push through even if you're scared. Is this sort of the same message? <laughs> the symbolism of this can be a beautiful reminder of how to confront life's obstacles. As humans, we tend to procrastinate and fear big upcoming tasks or challenges that comes our way. But as we all know, repressed feelings and problems often grows bigger in the end. As we all know, where's the evidence that we all know this? <laughs> often grows bigger in the end. Okay, let's say we know. So what? <laughs> so these words, be like the bison, gave me courage to face the storm within myself when I needed it the most. Four magical words can give you courage, and if that's not enough, you can buy a necklace and have four magical words that will give you courage when you're really broken down. It's so simple. I believe that when we are in a time of deep transformation, I think it's more important than ever not to hide from things that are uncomfortable, or not to get stuck in old patterns or old ways of believing things just because it feels safe. Please do not get stuck on old patterns because it feels safe. Isn't that a perfect reason to get stuck because it feels safe? Well, why wouldn't you do something that feels safe? But instead, go right into that storm of emotions or fear or whatever it might be. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> Because it feels unsafe and you're like a bison. And face the things that makes you uncomfortable. Look how uncomfortable she is. And feel it with your whole being. Bring it up to the surface so that you can release it and allow the storm to clear your path. What the heck does that mean? Allow the storm to clear your path. That's all you have to do? Let the chaos just fix your life by itself? Is that how reality works? <laughs> you face your fears and you see your life as a fuck up. And then the storm that comes just clears your life. This only works if you buy the necklace. <laughs> It's easier said than done, and most of the times, words like these just stays as inspirational words. Hey, she's owning this. Is she going to give us more evidence? But right now, I try my best to live them. <laughs> she doesn't... <laughs> That's all of her argument is, I try my best to, to follow whatever. Best to live them. 
And that's also why I wanted to create a piece of jewelry with these words. That's also why, because the jewelry gives you more power. So that I could carry them with me, not only in my heart, but as a physical reminder to believe in my inner strength and power. There, that's why. You need the physical reminder. And to grow with every storm. Every storm you will grow. Because that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Until that which doesn't kill you makes you weaker. But it's a nice saying that that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I found it's not true, but it, for some people it might be true. So keep repeating that. And to you, my friend, who is watching this right now. You're her friend. She thinks you're a friend. Isn't that charming? Isn't that soothing? Keep walking, one step at a time. We will get through this together, and you are not alone. Whatever you are going through right now, it's going to be alright. How does she know? How do you know if you trust this? <laughs> what if it's not going to be alright? <laughs> what if it feels like it's not going to be alright, and then you injuncting yourself to lie to yourself that it's all right you're exiling and you're yelling at your inner child that's scared to death <laughs> because you are a bison oh that's why so this is the new thing if you want a gender you want an identity you can now identify as a bison change your pronouns to bison and yeah your life will be easier. And buy the necklace. You are meant to go through storms. Be like the bison. You are meant to go through storms. Oh, we're losing K. She signed off at perfect timing. Be like the bison. Let me go find the the Be Like the Bison video for people that want the answer. The bison might not have a sensation of <laughs> of coldness, so then it's easy for it to <laughs> to be in the cold. Be like the bison. Joan or Jona, Jana Jinton. I don't know how much the necklace costs, but here's the video. <laughs> it took her two years to make the necklace. Jewelry shop. So reactions to the video, I sort of soured it by adding my interpretation, so I didn't give it a fair narrative. Are people inspired? Are people annoyed by it? Did it bring up any emotions, positive or negative? Did you like her voice? Isn't it? The, the music and the voice and the scenery was pretty. It's so soothing. It's soothing to Zoe. Yeah. I'm gonna fell asleep. <laughs> Yeah, the music Be like wasn't... the bison and fall asleep. The music wasn't overdone. I don't know. It was like one but... of those kitties with the, the daily meditation thing going on. It was very meditative, maybe, the sound. How much do you think the, the necklace costs? <laughs> One hundred fifty-four dollars, if that's in U.S. Free shipping worldwide. Isn't yeah, that's that a crazy. Good deal? If, if I'd taken that money, one hundred twenty-six pounds, and actually spent it on my heating this winter, then I could get through it. But that's ridiculous. 
but if you think you're like a bison, you won't need heat. <laughs> I'll just stop shaving this winter. I can be like a bison. You just need to get the necklace and change your pronouns, and you don't need heat. You'll grow fur. It's not inspiring. Okay, nine o'clock. How do we finish this off? Maybe we, we come out with a necklace that's a little bit cheaper that has a compass inside. So there's actually some utility to it. And then we, I guess, outsell that market. Well, we need a, a catchphrase with the compass. Find and your way to your answer. Yeah. Well, be used, a metaphor. Be used to other animals use magnetics to find the true north, so maybe it's like the bison trying to figure out where it needs to go to avoid death. Just make it more teach teaching oriented. Yeah, but if you're telling people to avoid death, that's kind of depressing. You need something, you know, inspiring, like be like a bison and the storms just clear up everything by magic. That's sounds like an easier deal. like here a compass and you have to navigate it yourself that's like work that's like danger why would i do that i just want to be a bison <laughs> or bee yeah maybe turn it into some bee narrative or story be like a smart bee <sighs> Okay, I'm running out of stuff to do. Let's start with... I have some control, I have some say. It feels good. I have some control, I have some say. I like saying that. I have some control, I have some say. I have some control, I have some say. I have some control and I have some say. I do have some control and some say. Because I have some control and I have some say. Because I have some control and I have some say. And I have control and I have some say very reckless, very reckless, very reckless. It is very dangerous to have control and say. But circling back, rupture repairs are the key. It's not a good pivot. But and when I think need about every friendship that's no longer in my life right now, I think about how we failed to repair a rupture. And ruptures are actually opportunities to strengthen relationships because each time you repair, it proves that the relationship can navigate problems with love, compassion, and understanding. So there are three components to good repairs. One, the ability to apologize. That really hurt my feelings. Well, I'm sorry that you have so many feelings. It's kind of easy to hurt that. Well, that's a good apology. You should write that down. <laughs> I'm sorry you have so many feelings. It's easy to hurt them. That's good. <laughs> I'm sorry that you have so many feelings. It's kind of easy to hurt them. I'm so sorry that I hurt your feelings. Thank you so much for telling me. It wasn't my intention, but impact is what matters. Two, the ability to forgive. Hey, are you okay? I'm fine. Okay, well, it just seems like you're mad. Why, why would I be mad? Why? What would I even be mad about? Oh, that fight we had a year ago where you genuinely apologized and never repeated that hurtful behavior? That makes no sense. <laughs> and finally, the ability to learn. It's very easy for us to get defensive when ruptures happen, to feel like it's an attack on who we are, and not a learning opportunity about that unique individual and how to love them. And in every single failed friendship, and probably relationship that I have, rupturers were met with an inability to complete one of these three components, either by the other person or by me. And finding friends who value repairing the ruptures is the secret to keeping good friendships. So don't think of it as losing friends, but as weeding out relationships that ultimately can't serve the kind of repair you need to be lasting. Don't think of it as weeding out friends, 
Think of it as finding friends、Bonus. that either by the other person or by me. And finding friends who value repairing the ruptures is the secret to keeping good friendships. Okay, there. Finding friends that value that is the secret to keeping good relationships. While her fellow two friends abandon her because she was not good at something <laughs> on her birthday, uncle. In her real life, but don't worry about actual lived experience. <laughs> Injunctions and performance are what matter because you're codependent. It's the illusion of performing stuff. Okay, that didn't end very well. Let's go with Richard Grannon since he's getting back to his old self. Trauma affects your brain. It switches off parts of your brain. It makes parts of your brain smaller. How smart do you think you're going to be with a shriveled little winky of a fucking hippocampus? <laughs> Imagine you have a shriveled little winky of a hippocampus. That is so pitiful. That is very sad. Now you don't know how to assign an emotion to an event. What is that? I'm going to get really upset about a Facebook post. Of course you are, because you're not regulated. I'm going to get really upset about a thing that's happening millions of miles away that doesn't affect me. Of course you are, because you're totally emotionally dysregulated. It makes you、uh, thin-skinned. Trauma affects your brain. It makes you very, very, very thin-skinned. So if it makes you thin-skinned, what do you need? You need to toughen your skin up. How do you toughen your skin up? By exposing yourself to to hardship, like a bison, and then the storms will wipe wipe away all your problems if you just take one step into the cold and freeze your balls off. It doesn't hurt if you think you're a bison. And remember Kelly's advice. I have control, and I have some say. Very reckless. Very reckless. Very reckless. Do have some control, and some say. 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 Do have some control. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Aniakan has spoken. Okay, I'm done. 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 Aniakan. Nom 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 nom. Oh, nom 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 nom. Thank you, everybody. 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 Thank thank you, everybody. Everybody, everybody, that's all, folks.